thanks everybody for um, joining this um, afternoon for this lunchtime uh, seminar or webinar um, hosted by the MS Academy uh, entitled Attack MS or What Does Treating MS Early Mean in Clinical Practice? Uh, I'm joined, uh, my, my name is Klaus Schmier. I'm a professor of neurology at Queen Mary University of London and at Barts Health. So my base is, is in Whitechapel um, between the Royal London Hospital and the Blizzard Institute. Um, and I'm joined by Rachel Horn, uh, who is a journalist and um, has multiple sclerosis herself. And um, she will sort of take us into this uh, webinar today, uh, share some of her experience before I will uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the sort of medical perspective on early treatment of MS and what we're planning to do with ATTAC. So thanks for joining Rachel. I know it's quite early in the day for you, um, but great you're up and up and, um, uh, and and with us now. Thank you very much, Klaus. As, as Klaus mentioned, my name is Rachel Horn. I'm a journalist and I've had MS for more than a dozen years. As for Professor Schmier, Klaus, I've known him for five years now. And although I'm treated at Barts Health in London, he is not my neurologist, nor do I have any disclosures. A year ago, last February, Klaus approached me to see if I'd be interested in becoming the patient and public involvement representative in the trial management group into a study he was putting together called Attack MS. After telling me in a few sentences what the trial aimed to do, I was hooked. Attack MS was a study I would have loved to have been part of as a patient. For one thing, I was exactly the patient the trial is targeting, someone who appears in front of a doctor with severe stroke-like symptoms, which turn out to be MS. Second, I would have wanted all those years ago, and in hindsight, to have been offered uh, on diagnosis a highly effective disease-modifying therapy, a DMT, to slow my MS. And third, if this trial proves successful, I would like to see this approach to treating MS, hitting it hard and hitting it fast, becoming mainstream. Because make no mistake, MS waits for no one. Over the past dozen years, I've listened to many stories, too many to count, of people with MS who were told they had this chronic, progressively disabling disease, but then were forced to wait months, even years, before they could start on drug treatments. I've also heard too many times about how much damage they accumulated in the meantime, damage that was irreversible. I empathize with them because it also happened to me. Here's my story. In late 2009, uh, 2009 when I was 43, I noticed a tingling in my right hand, which would not go away. I was fit and healthy, so I presumed it was a pinched nerve. Over the next few days, it was followed by other odd symptoms. So by the time I appeared at my GP, I was, I was in a sorry state. My vision was beginning to blur. I had numbness on my right hand, extreme tiredness, balance issues, vertigo, and was beginning to drag my leg. In his office, my GP carried out some tests such as, you know, finger to nose, finger to finger test, which I all, which all of them I failed. And he insisted I get an MRI ASAP. At this point, I was in the private system. The next day, I did get an MRI where I was injected with gadolinium, the enhancing agent. Later that evening, my doctor found me at home, never a good sign, and said he was putting me on steroids and had booked me to see a specialist at a London hospital. My husband Googled his name. He was a neurologist who specialized in MS. A few days later, my husband and I met with him. He carried out more tests and said MS was on the cards. He did not show me my MRI. That week I was admitted to hospital. By now I was unable to walk independently and I had nystagmus in my left eye, which left it ricocheting back and forth like a ping pong ball. I was almost paralyzed in half my body, sort of a line just down the center. At the hospital, I had a slew of blood tests, started receiving IV steroids, uh, methylprednisolone, 1000 milligrams, and had a lumbar puncture. On the third day, my consultant confirmed I had MS and I was discharged home. There was no discussion of starting my DMTs or any treatments, just an appointment to return two months later in the new year to see how I was doing. The next month, after several weeks recovering in bed, I returned to my GP. 
He told me my MRI had reve revealed a dozen old scars in my brain, along with a large lesion the size of 50p coin, his quote, not mine, on my brain stem, which had caused my recent hospitalization. By the time I saw my neurologist in January, I fortunately had recovered. He was pleased and suggested we adopt a wait and see approach when it came to putting me on a drug. After all, the consultant pointed out, I might never have another relapse. And technically this was my first one under the McDonald criteria. Plus some of the drugs to treat MS, he told me had potentially serious side effects. So I agreed. Now let's pause for a moment. Why did I go ahead with his advice? And why was I so willing to do nothing despite MRI evidence I'd had the disease for at least five years? Obviously this is something I've given much thought. For one thing, my husband and I knew very little about MS. None of my friends nor relatives had the disease. In 2010, information on the internet was not so widespread. And remember, I was sitting across from a specialist who had spent his whole career studying MS in a hospital renowned internationally for its research into neurology and neuroimmunology. He was the expert, we were not. It's also worth pointing out, we were having this conversation in early 2010. Then the prevailing notion in MS scientific community was that drug treatment was best postponed until patients really needed it. It was also a belief now it's proved, and I'm sure Klaus can explain further, that between relapses, MS was effectively quiet. So we both agreed, the neurologist and I, that there was likely no harm in waiting for me to have a second relapse to start on treatment, on drugs, if indeed I did have one. Nine months later, I did have another one. Thankfully, this was milder, but this time I didn't recover and was left with left foot drop and left side weakness. My neurologist put me on Capaxone, a mildly effective drug. Then I had another relapse, which left me with permanent double vision in part of my left eye. So the neuro put me on Tecfidera, a moderately effective drug. It was only when I had further symptoms a few years ago and switched neurologists and hospitals was I put on a Crevis, a highly effective drug. Do I wish I was put on it or something similar as soon as I was diagnosed? Yes. Do I believe I would have less disability today if that had happened? Again, yes, although I can never prove it. So you can understand why I'm eager to be involved in this study. But I was concerned I might be approaching it with my 2010 biases. So Klaus asked me to carry out some research to recruit a group of people diagnosed with MS in the last two years and to ask them a series of questions about their diagnostic and treatment experiences to get a feel. Of, 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 their, um, of their views and would they be willing to go on a DMT, um, even with largely suspected MS. So essentially he wanted to determine if they had been willing to make a quick decision on whether to start on a highly effective drug, even though they might not have 100% confirmation that they had MS. What would sway them? Where would they like this conversation to take place? And how would they like the information presented to them? After all, this is a highly emotionally charged conversation, one that the patient will remember for the rest of his life. Trust me on that. I've got a few slides which cover this. So I put out a call on the social network Shift MS and through Twitter. I found Twitter easier and speedier as a recruitment tool. Within a few days, I had my focus group of eight, as you can see. Five women, three men, all recently diagnosed and all on DMTs, except for one exception. I gathered the diagnosis history ranging from seven years to five months and asked them a variety of questions. Did your diagnosis come as a shock? How was it communicated? Do you think you would have been able to decide within 24 hours to go on medication, even though you weren't 100% sure your MS was confirmed? What would be the optimum setting? And would it be acceptable to receive it in a busy a and &E? I'd also heard when I was chatting to them about missed opportunities and misdiagnoses, as well as their interactions with various health professionals. The results of the, the, results of the eight, six would have agreed immediately to start on a DMT. 
And of the, the other, there was two exceptions, as you can see. The group also clarified how they would have wanted to hear the news. Some would have preferred to have been on their own. Others wanted, would have preferred to have a family member or friend with them. If there was more time, I would have tried to find more participants who were diagnosed after appearing at A&E with severe sudden symptoms. It said all group members had gradual mounting MS symptoms over a long period. Only one, Katrina, went to A&E with double vision and was sent home. The rest consulted their GPs. So no, it was not truly representative, but I still believe that it gave some insight into the patient's experience. And I hope Klaus and the other neurologists found it useful. Now let's fast forward to a few days ago. As I was writing out this presentation, I was interested to see what a larger group of people with MS felt about this trial and to envision themselves as one of the participants. What would they do? And yes, I'm very aware that hindsight's a wonderful thing. So on Saturday, I posted this on Twitter. I have about 2,500 followers, mostly people with MS. As you can see there, asking them if you showed up at A&E with odd symptoms, had an MRI to show demyelination, then told by a neuro, you, a neuro that you were more than likely to have MS, would you agree to start on Tysabri or Natalizumab? Well, the response I got was pretty instant. Within 48 hours, I had 39 responses, which is actually quite a, a bit, I thought, with the overwhelming majority saying they would agree to start treatment within days if they were that patient in A&E. This included those who've been recently diagnosed to those who had MS for years. On the one hand, this did not come as a huge surprise. My followers are knowledgeable and vocal about MS. But what did surprise me, though, is how strongly they felt about this issue and how strong their reasons were. And there's a few of the reasons given. I hope I've been able to show just how significant this trial is to people with MS. It's something that we've been waiting a very long time for. It's also, I think, hopefully gives an insight into some of the feelings of people, uh, what they're facing, what their fears are, and why they would like this to go ahead. I also hope, if it is, is um, successful, that this trial will lead to a significant shift in how we treat MS. So a huge heartfelt thanks to Klaus and his team and all those involved, and also a huge thanks to all of you who are listening and taking the time to hear about these views. Fabulous. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, um, for this introduction from your perspective. I think it's um, um, quite sort of illuminating what you know you, you yourself feel uh, about your own story, but um, uh, obviously also I, I followed a little bit the responses you received from Twitter. So. Overall, I think people seem to be quite positive. Yeah, so I'm going to um, go into this from a, a medical perspective uh, now, and uh, I, I trust we'll have a sufficient time for questions after this. So there yeah, are some disclosures, and the, the key element here of the disclosures is that uh, I'm the chief investigator of uh, the ATT&CK MS study, uh, which is a multi-center trial, and um, it is supported by Bargen. Um, but it is an investigator-led study, so it's not um, sponsored by Bargen, but sponsored by Queen Mary University of London. And, um, uh, and um, so they, they have uh, very limited sort of impact or influence on uh, what we actually do there. So I'm going to break down my talk uh, into four pieces. Um, first, briefly talking about the role of inflammatory demyelination then about the fact that MS is a progressive disease uh, from uh, onset, um, the importance of time, and um, then the question how hard we uh, need to hit um, uh, to uh, control uh, MS. Um, however, MS um, sort of starts uh, initially, and there's obviously some of you may have been aware of the recent discussion or renewed discussion around the role of EBV in uh, the pathogenesis uh, or other factors. I think a key element in the disease is the uh, ineffectively regulated adaptive immune response. And this is uh, on the left here, just an example of a perivascular 
um, infiltrate that you typically find in uh, the tissue when you look under the microscope uh, of somebody with uh, MS. Uh, so these are largely CD20 positive uh, B cells here, but there are also um, uh, quite a lot of um, CD8 positive T cells. And you see here the vascular, perivascular cuff, and then the uh, movement sort of outwards uh, of a, uh, an, an area of active demyelination. So that is um, a key element in the pathogenesis. Now, um, is that um, of importance or do we get always repair? Um, we've looked at um, this um, uh, a few years ago to, um, to essentially establish the impact of the uh, demyelination that occurs as part of um, uh, this inflammatory activity uh, in uh, brain and spinal cord tissue. Um, so one element that we re-established, as it were, in this study on postmodern tissues is that in a life with MS, you lose about 60% of your uh, corticospinal tract axon. So uh, over half of these motor fibers are lost. Uh, that's here in the bottom right. Um, and in a separate experiment, uh, we explored to what degree this um, is specifically related to demyelinating lesions. So here you can see um, a spinal cord and an axial uh, cut with a lesion on one side and no lesion on the other side. And um, we then established the axonal count um, compared to the contralateral homotopical area in this area uh, compared to the other side, but made sure that above and below there are no lesions that would impact on the measurement at this very level here. Um, and what we found there is that about 50, there was about 50% difference between those two sides, clearly establishing that um, the, it is the uh, demyelinating um, uh, lesion that actually led to axonal uh, loss, or if you want, uh, and was associated with axonal loss. And you can even establish that and confirm that uh, over, over 25 years after um, the diagnosis was made, because this was the average time of these postmortem samples. The inflammation is incredibly important, and um, that's why we need to address it. But there's uh, the the second question: to what that in, uh, to what degree uh, that impacts on uh, long-term disability? Um, and first, uh, um, and before discussing that, um, I just want to uh, highlight briefly um, the fact that there is a progressive element in MS from the very beginning. Um, on the right, um, some of you may have seen uh, this type of change in people with MS's brain um, over time, not necessarily in this kind of serial fashion as it's been um, produced here, but you can see that, um, that there's um, a brain volume loss happening. What does that reflect? Well, we've looked at this uh, as well in uh, postmortem um, hemispheres of people who donated their uh, CNS to the MS tissue bank uh, at Hammersmith Hospital. And we could see here on the left, these graphs, um, the, the difference between uh, controls and people with multiple sclerosis who over a life with MS, you lose about 40% of uh, your cortical neurons. Um, that's obviously the bad news. The good news is that this loss or the number of neurons was very strongly associated with the thickness of the cortical ribbon. So that you can um, uh, infer um, that uh, brain volume loss, in fact, um, uh, um, uh, demonstrates a neuronal loss um, uh, reasonably well. Now, is that something that only happens in the latter phases of the disease? Um, uh, that is uh, unfortunately not the case. So these are people with secondary progressive and primary progressive MS, and you can see that they have just as much overall volume uh, loss um, as people with relapsing MS and those with clinically isolated syndrome, so who then turn out to be MS. So these are people who have the first manifestation, um, but who do not fully at that stage um, fulfill the criteria for multiple sclerosis. So they already have brain volume loss. And more recently, we've also looked in, um, at people with uh, what's called radiologically isolated syndrome. 
people who have an MRI scan for headache or otherwise and have typical lesions um, as, uh, they, as they occur with demyelination. And if they do turn out to have MS, which is the case in about a third, then um, they uh, demonstrate the same degree of um, volume loss. Um, so it's all just showing that the, you know, demonstrating the, the story of um, uh, MS being a progressive disease from onset. So time is uh, important, um, as in many diseases, um, earlier treatment is uh, useful and better than later disease. And when you look at timing, you can um, first look at the um, importance or the association between when you were diagnosed with MS and, um, uh, and how you fared over, over time. And here are people uh, reaching an EDSS of six. So these are uh, those who are not familiar with this measure of disability, the expanded disability status scale. Uh, an EDSS of six is uh, one stick around the block. So somebody you, uh, uh, with MS uh, requiring a cane to walk um, uh, around about 100 uh, uh, meters. And um, so you can see here that if you were diagnosed uh, before the year 2000, 27% um, um, of uh, people with MS reached an EDSS of six at age 50. And when you were diagnosed after, it was only 15%. Now it's um, uh, easy to uh, to uh, to align this with um, the emergence of disease modifying treatment. So you can see here that pre disease modifying treatment, uh, the probability of reaching an EDSS of six um, at age sixty five was up there. And then there came the first licensed disease modifying treatment, so the rate was a little bit lower. And more recently, um, the rate is yet lower. Um, well, since so-called high efficacy DMTs are around. Now, there are probably other factors involved in this, um, but it is um, a, a one way of looking at the impact of time in a slightly different um, uh, way than we normally look just at, you know, timing of individual uh, treatment. Um, let's see. Now, this is a little bit closer to, um, to, uh, to home, as it were, when we're looking at um, uh, treatment delay after diagnosis. You can see here with it's only uh, less than one year, the proportion of uh, patients not reaching an EDSS of four. So EDSS of four means limited walking range. The uh, first time, three, five is unlimited. Four is the first time people develop limitations in their walking range. Um, <clears throat> it's... Uh, is up here, but if you have a delay of over three years, um, the um, proportion of those uh, with uh, uh, not reaching an EDSS is um, uh, down here, so at around 0.7 versus 0.9. Um, so that is um, uh, looking at all treatments that we have at the moment. And in this study, it was about two thirds who were treated with the so-called platform therapies and one third with uh, highly effective uh, disease-modifying treatments. So MS, as so many uh, medical conditions generally, but certainly also uh, including neurological conditions, have um, the characteristics of an iceberg with lots of it happening below the waterline and only uh, certain elements uh, detectable uh, for us. Um, uh, and but we know that um, those are obviously relevant for the overall outcome, so time matters uh, greatly. Um, and now the, I, I was talking about treatment in general, but the question is obviously how hard we need to to hit. Um, do we um, need to start or should we start with highly effective treatment uh, straight away or lose use a wrecking ball uh, right from the right from the start. I think um, the evidence for that is emerging um, at pace. Uh, this is from a study based on a large data set from the uh, MS base um, registry, which is the largest um, uh, registry of this type uh, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the on the uh, in the world. Um, so. Um, what has been done here is uh, to look at 
uh, the cumulative hazard um, of uh, um, uh, disability at um, uh, being on uh, or starting disease modifying treatment, highly effective disease modifying treatment with delay versus um, early or from the very beginning. And there are three ways that uh, the data was sort of cut here from the first disease modifying treatment, from disease onset, and from six years after disease onset. And you can always see that the red line is the late starters um, with highly effective treatment and the blue line is those with early starts. And you can clearly see that the the separation of these um, uh, lines uh, here. And what's interesting is even if you then switch after six years to a highly effective treatment, there's still kind of a widening of that gap. So what it essentially says is what is lost um, is a lost and um, uh, you probably also um, uh, have a different platform for which you then um, try and recoup or uh, or kind of just stabilize the condition. We've um, recently therefore made the, made the case um, for highly effective treatment from, uh, from the very beginning. Now, one problem with this data, however, is, and this is where attack MS comes into play, is that even those who were on early disease and early highly effective uh, treatment uh, had at least one year delay between diagnosis and treatment. So time here, um, uh, whilst it matters, um, is something that we're still trying to address yet further. And this is really the rationale for uh, the study called ATTACK MS, um, uh, addressing the question, how early is early indeed? Um, uh, is it an effective way to repair, to remyelinate? And this is um, refers to the outcome we're going to use. Um, we are pretty certain that there is a need to change current practice in order to facilitate brain health. And uh, we're hopeful that um, the study may uh, help uh, facilitate this. Um, and the question is obviously then with which compound can you do this uh, in, in such an acute scenario um, and that has no license for the indication clinically isolated syndrome uh, as well. And, and we, uh, we found that to be uh, natalizumab, um, which has been around since 2006, a, a drug that is uh, used for uh, so-called rapidly evolving severe multiple sclerosis, but you need to have two relapses at the moment over the last two years, uh, sorry, over the last 12 months in order to be eligible uh, for this. And, um, but it has a number of advantages in this specific situation in that it doesn't have a long-term effect on the immune system. It has a, 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 a washout within, I mean, in, within two months, it is uh, well and clearly sort of out of the system. And uh, so even in the, um, the context of an acute a and &E type of um, uh, um, administration, uh, the risk of, of the, um, uh, the, the drug is um, much lower uh, in the long term uh, than if you would start straight away with, say, an immune reconstitution therapy or a B cell depleter, which helps yeah, has a much, much longer uh, effect. So this is Tysabri, and this is just a, a, a slide here on this or a graph on the side, on the right side, that demonstrates the uh, massive effect it has on MRI lesions. So these were number of new lesions, and at two, the both doses that were tested back in the day uh, of natalizumab, you could see that uh, the new lesions essentially flatline straight away uh, within a month. And um, that is uh, corroborated um, uh, with, um, by the, the clinical outcome data, which is very positive um, uh, with, uh, with Tysabri. The, uh, the study is um, a collaboration between uh, Queen Mary and uh, three trusts at this stage. So uh, Bart's Health, um, Chelsea Westminster and St. George's. Um, MRI for the study will be done uh, for all of, uh, all of patients uh, at Queen Square. Um, the um, OCT 
So optical coherence tomography will be analyzed at uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital and the financial support for this is um, from Biogen, but the study is sponsored by uh, Queen Mary. And uh, so the PCTU, which belongs to Queen Mary, um, uh, manages the study. This is the overview. And uh, the key element here that is really important for everyone on this call is the um, uh, this here, the randomization window of 14 days. And this is where I think that one of the biggest uh, challenges is, and this is why it is actually a primary ob objective um, uh, to establish whether it is feasible in the NHS to enroll people at first manifestation of a clinically isolated syndrome within 14 days. And then second uh, or a core uh, joint primary objective to test whether uh, Thais um, uh, um, is superior compared to placebo in that situation um, uh, um, to only a placebo. It's placebo combined with um, IV methapretnisolone. So it, um, both arms will have uh, IV methapret. And then from month three onwards, uh, all patients will go on to nadalizumab. We've chosen a, um, a, a placebo-controlled uh, setting here, obviously, to detect the signal as clearly as possible, but also uh, bearing in mind that three months is a very short time frame for anyone uh, initially diagnosed, and, and I think Rachel gave a little bit of an example there, um, for anyone diagnosed with the disease. So that's um, why we think it's quite attractive for people um, at first manifestation to be offered straight away uh, um, being being enrolled in this study. So B3 MRIs, this is the primary um, uh, outcome here, which is lesion magnetization transfer ratio. And then there'll be a second MRI at the end of the study. Uh, we have agreement from NHS England for everyone who is on the trial then to be uh, onwards treated with, um, uh, with natalizumab on the NHS. And there's some standard uh, tests that's going to be uh, undertaken, the CSF. Um, we will look at serum neurofilament uh, levels over time as well. This is always associated with the infusion, of course, which so it doesn't need an extra cannulation or, or phlebotomy. Uh, these are the three uh, recruitment sites, and um, Queen Square is um, the MRI center. However, I want to stress that consultant to consultant referrals um, can come from all over the UK, really. Now, you might find that a little bit um, a bit of a stretch in, uh, if you're uh, in, in, Ed in Edinburgh or in Inverness, and I agree with you. Um, uh, so it, it may rather apply really for people within the M25 but I can't see why somebody, say, based in Nottingham or uh, Brighton or um, uh, elsewhere outside the M25, shouldn't be at least considered for the study um, uh, if, if seen really in, in the acute setting and so early after first um, symptoms. Um, this is just an overview of the uh, management group and the committees. So lots of people, of course, involved. Um, so here's um, John Mears, who's another PPI member, and here's Rachel. And uh, so obviously the DMC, which includes um, Neil Robertson and uh, Vicky Williams and Gary Cutter in, the, in Alabama. So this is the aims and objectives. So to test in a placebo-controlled trial, 40 patients, 20 per arm um, in people with a first manifestation, either with a diagnosis of MS that can be made there and then, or if even if not, um, if they have clinically isolated syndrome um, and not demonstrating dissemination in time at that stage, um, they, uh, they are uh, eligible uh, and the primary clinical objective is as discussed. Um, I just want to um, uh, say a couple of words on the remyelination. So this is um, a demyelinated lesion here with two blood vessels uh, and all blue here is myelin and where it's white, there's no myelin. This is um, a remyelinated um, uh, area. So it's more thinly uh, myelinated, but we know from experimentation that um, these are quite functional um, when they're 
um, re remarinated uh, and um, you can not really um, pick this up on MRI um, without doing specific tricks and that is magnetization transfer. So that is a quantitative uh, technique where two uh, scans are being obtained and then <clears throat> a um, a uh, um, uh, a, a, um, uh, a calculation will be undertaken that is based on the exchange between um, the semi-solid pools, so the um, protons um, that are part and parcel of macromolecules, so axons and myelin, and um, um, uh, protons in free water, and the exchange between the two that um, bill is the underpinning or uh, for for the magnet for magnetization transfer and that ratio uh, allows uh, a a um, 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 an assessment of the change in macromolecular um, content as it were in 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 the in the area examined and we've looked at this a number of years ago it correlates really very well with myelin so um, this is a postmortem uh, um, uh, brain slice, uh, which was scanned, and then this is the MTR map. And when you then look at uh, the the amount of myelin and MTR, it's, it's a strong association between the two. It's not completely sort of um, um, uh, specific, but nothing really in in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of these uh, measures is entirely specific, but it's certainly driven uh, very strongly by myelination. Just going to jump over this. Um, so these are the hypotheses. I just want to go uh, straight to inclusion criteria because I think this is really important for everyone. If you see somebody in A and E um, in your acute neurology clinic, uh, these are the very, I mean, straightforward uh, criteria. Somebody with the first manifestation, um, they should have an MRI, and this is what happens very often in people who turn up as stroke type presentations, um, people who are between 18 and 45 in the study, um, and then people realize, well, they're actually quite young for stroke, so, um, and maybe there are atypical things for a uh, stroke, no risk factors, no hypertension, no diabetes, no other otherwise risks. An MRI has been done and you find uh, two or more um, lesions that are characteristic of demyelination, and then the next thing you should do is uh, essentially call the trial team. But this is just to illustrate the three characteristic um, uh, locations. So there's infratentorial, so here a uh, brainstem or in the cerebellum, then here in a periventricular location, uh, juxtacortical, um, and of course in the spinal cord. Now, not necessarily you will have spinal cord uh, imaging. But um, so the brain may be sufficient. So two lesions and uh, brain MRI uh, will suffice. Uh, there's a number of exclusion criteria, but they're all pretty standard, mainly to do with, um, uh, with the risk of MRI. Um, and um, and uh, we also want to make sure that we're not including people who've had MS for some time, but we're simply not aware. So we obviously, I mean, many of the on this call will know that people can sometimes have, sometimes have um, depression or other sort of um, cognitive uh, changes that ultimately turn out to, um, to be due to demyelination. And there may be a lot of hypo intensities or black holes on the scan uh, already, so you're only allowed to have one of those uh, on that uh, initial scan. This is what we're going to distribute uh, across um, certainly um, uh, London, and um, but anyone uh, really who is uh, interested, uh, just an information poster or card, anyone with a stroke-like syndrome but doesn't have a stroke, symptom onset within 14 days, that age, MRI suggestive of demyelination, then uh, email for the moment. Uh, you can email uh, us at uh, QMUL, um, and, and then there will obviously specifically or site-specific information for, uh, for the uh, trial teams. Um, it's important to remember this trial is not open yet for recruitment, 
Uh, it'll start in May or June. And um, if you are interested in it, please email us and um, we'll certainly be uh, in, in touch with um, with the with the A&E teams. So that's all um, from me. Rachel, maybe you have a question that suddenly come, came up. <laughs> yes. Why do you think, um, speaking as somebody, you know, and with hindsight, why do you think, was there any resistance to doing this trial? Um, I don't think we had much resistance. I think it was all about um, people um, being uh, convinced and, and, and or hopeful enough that we can actually do this in such a short, short time frame. The, the 14 days obviously has to do with the, um, the time, but the kinetics of um, demyelination and remyelination. So what we essentially want to achieve is that we really um, shut off the inflammatory response very early on in order to facilitate this process. And if we wait too long, then we probably, I mean, uh, the, the signal becomes diluted or we can't actually pick it up. And so this is the main main reason. Now, I'm, I wouldn't completely rule out that um, depending on how recruitment goes, that we extend that a little bit. But I think it'll always be at the, at the it's a bit at the mercy of the the clarity and uh, the crispness of the signal uh, that we can pick up. There is uh, somebody in the Q&A, which countries can include patients? Oh, this is a lovely question. Should I say um, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, it's a UK trial. It's, um, it's in London, um, uh, really, three centers in London. Um, but, um, and we, we, we probably wouldn't have uh, the capacity, um, well, our, our ethics wouldn't cover uh, anybody's from outside this territory at this, this moment. There's a good comment, it may be useful for local stroke teams to receive information in the trial as well as A&E. Absolutely, this is the plan. This is really, uh, in a way, this is a first um, webinar uh, for, of this type, so you are, you are in the vanguard of this. Um, but the idea is very much that we're actually reaching out to our colleagues outside neurology, because um, let's face it, uh, neurology used to be, and I think in many corners still is, very much a, um, a discipline that is, you know, is, is uh, sometimes a bit slow off the, uh, off the starting blocks. And um, it is really people who see um, these syndromes in a and &E, in acute neurology, uh, sometimes also GP. So we will spread the information widely. Uh, thank you, Julie. I think it was uh, for that for that comment. Uh, anything else? Anything that's not uh, un unclear about it? So, as I said, the the the, the first um, uh, objective is to actually recruit, and the second is can we uh, prove um, in a in in. in uh, that uh, the, there is an impact on magnetization transfer um, slash myelination or remyelination. Sorry, can I ask yeah. another question? Please? Yeah, absolutely. Speaking to your colleagues before lo obviously launching this trial, how many do you think in a busy A&E environment, say at Chelsea Westminster or St. George's, how many do you think they will... You, on average, will get, say, a month of patients walking in, of people walking in with severe sy um, symptoms, which turn yeah. out to be MS? There's only, I mean, a, a guesstimate at the moment. I would expect that we have about 50 to 60 new diagnoses um, a year, and um, that perhaps um, 20 to 30 percent would, uh, would um, uh, or so, or 20 to 30 of them would come through an acute pathway. Um, uh, so probably increasingly so. More recently, obviously, MS services have been down and the sort of standard pathways also uh, slightly obstructed. So um, uh, in that respect, I think uh, it's been positive that people actually get, went to A&E to, uh, to get sort of their medical or the, the, the issues addressed and not waiting for their GP appointment, uh, uh, etc. So that's, um, yeah. So we do expect it. It is a challenge, but I think one that um, 
that is not unrealistic to um, uh, to overcome. And is this the first trial of its kind uh, internationally, do you think? Uh, yes, certainly with this brevity of time. So that is, um, uh, there have been other sort of CIS um, uh, trials, so clinically isolated syndrome, but they um, had longer, um, longer delays. Now, one thing to add to, the, the, to your previous question, and it also covers this one, is actually, uh, have we seen uh, or have we been able to recruit in the past for this this with this uh, sh shortness of time and uh, and uh, I think it's worth mentioning the trial that was led by Raj Kapoor on optic neuritis, uh, where the average recruitment uh, window or time between manifestation and recruitment was uh, ten to eleven days. So we obviously we will we're obviously also hopeful that we get people referred from Moorfields Eye Hospital, for example, and we're working with, with the team there, um, certainly on the OCT level, so where the OCTs are being analyzed, but also hopeful for referrals from there, um, because many, as, as many on the core will know, the second most common first manifestation uh, of MS is optic neuritis. Will patient with uh, be excluded considering potential harm? Um, they will be, um, but they will um, not be based on a negative test. So they will have their first infusion um, regardless, as it were. So it is very much down to the, uh, the investigators at the site to make that call whether this is very likely a, um, an, an, a case of NMO, spectrum disorder, or not. Um, within the first four weeks, when the first infusion has been given, we will obviously receive the aquaporin 4 uh, result and also mock antibody result. Um, but there is a there is a minor, but there is a risk that um, they could be uh, treated with nadalizumab when that is. I think it's fair to say it's not um, um, it's it's not necessarily additional harm. It's more of not having benefit. I think that's that's fair to say. We know that uh, with interferons, we've seen that there's potential for um, less favorable outcomes, but I don't think um, for nalizumab that's convincing. Can we just email patients details to the email address on the flyer? Uh, well, for the moment, I think it's very much we're at the information phase. We will um, have another sort of launch event once the trial gets underway. Um, and then uh, by that time, we will have an NHS.net address where people can refer to. <clears throat> It'll probably be of the type like bartshealth.attackms <clears throat> at NHS.net, um, but that's currently uh, un un underway. Um, and uh, we'll, there will also be a telephone number um, to, to, to call. Okay, so a, a um, really a round the clock service to, um, to get as many into the study. When GC, JCV result is back, and if they are high positive, would you continue to have savory for the trial or aim to switch to other DNT? I think it is something that can be um, discussed. You may well be aware that <clears throat> there's been no uh, PML with less than a year's treatment of uh, natalizumab. So um, even if that were, were the case, that they are uh, high positive, I would have no um, concerns about them developing PML in such a short time frame. Um, and the exclusion criteria are such that um, uh, immune me uh, immune mediated conditions that you know are associated with immunosuppression are excluded as a uh, as a uh, and as a and as a condition for people to to be enrolled in the study, so that we essentially remove those who are on the on a high risk for PML anyway. So um, that was the um, anonymous. Uh, okay, sorry, I have answered a question without actually activating it. This was the question. Okay, when GSCV result is back, and if they're high positive. Would you continue to have every treatment? Um, and I think I've given the answer. I think I would. Um, three six months is not a not a, a big issue. But um, uh, at the um, 
at the visit in four months, there will be a discussion, uh, actually at three months, there will be a discussion about with a patient that's formalized in the protocol, what to do sort of after the uh, study finishes, um, whether to maintain or continue on Tysabri or switch to a different DMT or on occasion, there may be um, uh, doing nothing, although it's, it, I, I find that uh, it's very unlikely. Uh, there is another question by um, Beda uh, Mohammed. Oops. Uh, yeah. So, is there evident clinical correlation with the radiological impact on magnetization transfer? Um, yeah, there, there are, um, and certainly when we're looking at uh, lesion severity, um, we can clearly say that lesions with low MTR have a uh, less myelin and a, a, a more uh, pronounced degree of axon loss. Um, and um, the, the, you may be aware that some of the, some recent, but also some more um, not so recent trials have looked at using MTR as a, a measure of uh, lesion MTR, uh, uh, myelin recovery. There's been a study, for example, of clotirumor acetate that showed the drop at lesion evolution and then a better um, uh, remyelination capacity uh, with uh, clotirumor. And most recently, um, the use of that in the uh, Bexarotin uh, study uh, and also the um, uh, opicinumab, so the um, um, uh, trial also by, by, by Bargen, but just coincidentally um, using MTR to look at uh, remyelination. So um, there, 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 there is certainly, I mean, phase two evidence for uh, efficacy uh, and, and a good correlation between these measures. So this was um, really lively and I'm um, really grateful. Everybody's um, been uh, hanging around, 60 people here. That's beautiful to see. Um, at the, the interest, and um, I, I, I trust I'll be in touch with many of you. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for joining me this morning for you. Um, Rachel is a bit westwards from us at the moment. And, um, uh, and uh, thanks for, to the uh, Neuro Academy for hosting. And uh, I trust you are all eligible for a one CBD point as well uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks for your interest and have a nice day. Thank you.